Welcome to the Calder Farmstead. Now the ice hogs back out to center in transition. Carlson with Quinville two on one. Right wing Carlson comes with Quinville scores. Here's the chance for Perry. Fire from scores! Off the face off! Big Zeminger. Go back to Wierenski. Has it. Shoots one. Bounces off a man. Five seconds left. Wierenski. Another jam on the shot. Curry and fire it. Now, with nine minutes gone in overtime, the Bears breaking out. Right side with Bear. Looks like cutting for the net. Bear will go. And here are your hosts, CeCe and Sean. Hello and greetings from the mile high city of Denver, Colorado. And Whitby, Ontario. Oh, Canada. Welcome to the Calder Farmstead Podcast, episode number 85 for Tuesday, February 22nd, 2022 all the twos. <laughs> if you're hoping for a podcast featuring tips to prepare for spring planting, we are not going to be much help. This is an American Hockey League podcast, and my name is CC Hockley, the AHL editor of Full Press Hockey. And I'm Sean O'Brien from Stats Track and the AHL's only league-wide analytics guy. And as always, we thank you for tuning in with us. And if you're new to hearing CC and I talk about hockey, we're going to recap some of the matchups from the past weekend in the American Hockey League for you. We both watch a lot of games and are going to talk about what we see when we watch the film, as well as use some advanced stats to help us break it down. If that's new to you, you may want to head over to our uh, podcast feed or YouTube channel, wherever you're listening to us from, and check out episode zero. It's a short primer on some of the stats we're going to be talking about, as well as how we view what's important on the ice. So if you're newer to some of the more advanced hockey stats terms like PDO or the point shares model or newer hockey terms like controlled zone entries, uh, you probably should go check that out. So you better be able to pick up what we're putting down. I promise it's not that nerdy or technical. It's only 20 minutes. And let's be honest, you wasted 20 minutes seeing who the new Kentucky Derby winner is. You'll never get that time back. So why not next time spend a little more time with us talking hockey? Wait, they ran the Kentucky Derby this past weekend? No, it changed the winner, though. Oh. Oh, that's interesting. (laughs) Well, anyway, moving on. (laughs) Let's talk about our weekend picks, shall we? Before we recap the weekend, let's recap the picks of the weekend. So Sean, the model, well, Sean, the model and I rather, we were all pretty close until the last few games came on and on came in on Sunday. I barely edged out Sean this week though, with 17 of 31 to his 16 of 31. I was at 54.8%. He was at 51.6%. And the model beat us both, going Badly. 19 of 31, <laughs> 61.3%. Uh, rise of the Machines, per usual, here on the Calder Farmstead. Uh, season statistics, I've got a 52.7% positive pick rate. I am 7 and 4 overall against Shawnee. Sean, 51.7% positive pick rate uh yeah just one percentage point uh, separating the two of us that's how close it is and of course the model 54.7 percent <laughs> and uh we'll, we'll maybe catch up to that by the end of the season but uh don't Got put it. your money on it <laughs> if anything it's getting better <laughs> it really is it really is yeah. it had one stinker of a week a few weeks back and then it just continues to improve because sean continues to improve it he's just making it really accurate and predicting things fairly well. So anyway, with that all said, let's get ready. If you're watching on video, you see Sean is donning the Springfield Thunderbirds. uh, Really nice and clean looking red jersey. Always admired that. And uh, with that in mind, we're going to be previewing or previewing. We're going to be recapping rather (laughs) the weekend that was for the Springfield Thunderbirds. Saturday at Wilkes-Barre Scranton at 6.05 p.m. Eastern and Sunday at Lehigh Valley, 3.05 p.m. Eastern. The matinee game there on Sunday. We got a goals recap for both of those games and Sean O'Brien is going to give it to us. All right, Saturday first. Uh, Matt Barkowski breaks up the uh, Penguins, uh, breaks up a play in the Penguins' defensive zone, and Alex Nylander scoops up the loose puck and races around Sam Annis, who is covering for uh, a defenseman. Sorry, Sam. Yeah, Sam Annis is coming around a uh, for covering for a defenseman. Snaps one over the blocker of Joel Hofer. One nothing Penguins early in the second period. Mitch Ranky wrists one through traffic that beats Hofer to make, make it two to nothing. Uh, Wilkes Barre with just over seven minutes left in the second period. 
The T-Birds would strike back, though, as Sam Annis makes a beautiful heads-up read to James Neal for a power play goal to start the third period to bring Springfield back within one goal. Good fortune smiles on Springfield as Joss Wesley Todd ties the game at two with a turnaround shot from the half wall. The cop Tommy Napier having a nap, which seems appropriate, to get uh, tied at two with just over 10 and a half minutes left in the third period. Three periods of regulation and five minutes of OT do not give us a winner, so we have to head to the skills competition coin flip. Alex Nylander fakes the shot and double deeks backhand to forehand, tuck it low side on uh, low glove side on Hoffer. He is the only one to score in the shootout, meaning the Wilkesbury Scrantons take it three to two. Uh, Sunday, it takes to the second period before anyone gets on the board. On a rush chance, uh, Matthias Laferriere fires a shot that Ustamenko makes a pad save, but Drew Callen gets his hands on the rebound and buries it one nothing Springfield. Tyler Tucker clips the side of the net as he was making a routine puck retrieval behind the net. He loses control of the puck, and Tanner Lashinsky picks it up in the slot and rifles one past Chucky Sideburns to tie the game at one. James Neal breaks the tie as he puts one uh, past Ustamenko from the left half wall on a rush. A soft goal allowed by Ustamenko, but they count just as much. T-Birds take the lead 2-1 to one with just 11 and a half uh, minutes left in regulation. Nathan Walker would ice the game with an empty net. 3-1 to one Thunderbirds is your final against the Phantoms on Sunday. CC, we made some picks for this weekend. How did they go? Yes. So you, the model, and I were in one accord. We all picked a Thunderbirds sweep. And unfortunately, Wilkes-Barre Scranton didn't get the memo, and they won that first game. So um, at least we were half right, all, all three of us. So there's that. But uh, yeah, Springfield was a 56.6% favorite over Wilkes-Barre Scranton and a 55.2% favorite over Lehigh Valley on Sunday. So they were even slated for a little bit better odds against the baby pens, but them's the breaks. You can't, can't get them all right, especially well, man or machine. You can't, can't predict all these games, right? That's for sure. So Sean, not the most exciting games to watch. But three or four points on the weekend ain't too bad for the Springfield Thunderbirds. Let's start with Saturday. We all thought that Springfield would be better, would be a better team rather over the Wilkes-Barre Scranton Penguins, as we've already said probably two or three times already, or at least alluded to it. Um, what happened for Springfield to not get the W in Coal Country, Pennsylvania? I mean, Wilkes-Barre Scranton controlled the flow of play for long stretches of uh, time with good forechecking pressure. Uh, especially in the neutral zone. They, they managed to make sure that they shut the neutral zone down for good stretches of time, forced a lot of turnovers there or forced uh, Springfield to play a lot of dump and chase. By and large, too, Wilkes-Barre Scranton killed penalties well and helped stuff what had been a very successful Springfield power play to that point. I mean, yes, they scored uh, off a beautiful setup, off a face-off play, but by and large, uh, Wilkes-Barre Scranton did a great job of keeping them from getting set up in the zone uh, and making sure there was always pressure on the puck carrier which again is still very weird to see because Wilkes-Barre Scranton has been hot garbage on the penalty kill the rest of the season against other teams. But for some reason, they seem to pour it on Springfield, which feels almost random and very Texas shoop shirt, Texas sharpshootery. Uh, and if you're not familiar with the Texas uh, sharpshooter thing, it's basically a guy takes his revolver out, shoots it at the side of the barn and then goes and paints the target near where all the bullets are together and says, look, I'm a sharpshooter. That's that's kind of the that. idea is basically you're painting the target uh, around things that go that don't really go together. Uh, that's kind of how this feels where Wilkes-Barre Scranton is just somehow making it work against Springfield. Like it's random, but it just happens to be that that's where we painted the target afterward. Um, so th that's that's kind of how this feels, because like th I've seen them play other games in their penalty kill and it's not good. But for some reason, they seem to to play and execute well uh, against Springfield, which is weird. Um, Springfield had a lot of really good scoring chances in this game, but just didn't convert on them. Tommy Napier, outside of that kind of fluky goal by Josh Wesley, was pretty dialed in for this game. Uh, he made a lot of like glove saves with authority, if that makes sense. So he earned some style points uh, with some of those. Still, uh, Springfield owned the third period, but couldn't generate much despite dominating possession. Um, I thought they were the better team in overtime, but Napier stood tall. Um, it's there are also one very random observation from this game too, is that the T-Birds struggled heavily to complete basic D to D passes across the blue line. 
in the offensive zone. I think there were at least six times that I counted that they'd either have to regroup because the pass went outside the zone. They'd have to all come back in, you know, do that thing. Or it went like so far wide of the point. It looked like it was going to the face off dot. And it essentially just kind of became a dump in from already having possession in the offensive zone. And now this is not an essential problem, but like those were, you know, a handful of possessions that they kind of wasted because they couldn't complete what was a very common and basic pass. I didn't see anything in the, like this in Sunday's game, but it did end, you know, as I said, did end several offensive possession uh, possessions in Saturday's game, which is not nothing. So that probably uh, didn't help uh, in this game. Um, overall, I thought the T-Birds were the better team in the game, but it was close. Like, you really had to, you know, squint hard to see to see that result. They were pretty evenly matched in this game. Could be a lot of just, you know, the travel uh, going from, you know, Wilkes-Barre, Scranton to Lehigh Valley is not that big a bus ride, but Springfield's a little bit longer. I, I couldn't tell you, but this was not the... Not not a game where they lost where I would be sounding the alarm outside of that random uh, DD passes in the offensive zone that seemed to get away from them. And again, it wasn't there on Sunday. So it's unfortunate that they lost in the shootouts, um, but shootouts are uh, basically exciting, but essentially random ending to a game with a coin flip, which is why we address it like that in the goals recap of the skills competition coin flip. Um, but this is, you know... Uh, not a great loss, but the fact they came back down from uh, 2 nothing to make a game out of this, get a point in OT, that still says something about the character of this team, I think. Touching on Sunday, kind of in your Saturday recap there, let's flip over to Sunday properly here. And rounding off the Pennsylvania road trip was a Sunday matinee against the Phant Phantoms, like I mentioned earlier. Not the most exciting game, but one the T-Birds dominated for the majority of it. How did Springfield do it? It's weird because we talked about rest disadvantages uh, a while ago uh, when we talked about the uh, Stars and Admirals series, where we saw that Texas would look flat because they were coming at the end of a, I think it was a five and seven or a four and six, like some ridiculous yeah. stretch of games where it's like, they're going to be tired in these. And we kind of talked about what that looked like. And we didn't see that from Texas, but we saw, like I saw that from Lehigh Valley. They looked tired even though there was no big rest disadvantage. This was a regular, you know, just back-to-back -back weekend games for them as well, I believe. Uh, so you shouldn't have seen that there, and yet I definitely saw moments of it. Uh, the Phantoms looked for the majority of the game, though, like they were just gassed, and the Thunderbirds took advantage in a big way. Uh, they were flying around uh, the rink. They are putting defensemen on their heels. They forced the Phantoms to repeatedly go glassing out or dump and change after long possessions, and then they just... T-Bird just walk right back through the neutral zone, uh, put those defensemen on their heels in transition and get, you know, offensive zone time started again. Uh, Chucky Sideburns uh, was basically a Tyler Tucker not running into the net routine play away from a shutout in this game. He played really well. Um, the Neil Pekka and uh, Anis line was dominant in both games, um, The especially in Sunday's game. They seemed to be the only one out there that was constantly just when they were on the ice, they were driving play. They were creating scoring chances. Um, the McEachern, McGing, Torpchenko line and the Walker, Alexander, Bitten line did have good possession time. They were getting shots. They got time in the zone. They kept the Phantoms mostly off the board. Um, but they didn't really make anything dangerous in a lot of those offensive possessions. And in the grand scheme of things, is that a huge problem over the course of a, you know, a game, a weekend? No. No, it's not, it's, you know, uh, but something I'd still keep my eye on. It's a long season. And yes, that top line for Springfield has your three best forwards without question. Um, but you need other not lines to be able to carry the load some nights. Um, again, not hitting the panic button here, just something to kind of keep your eye on. I want to see a little bit more from some of their other lines against, especially two against teams that we would expect them to uh, have a heavy favorite against. I want to see second and third lines getting in on the, if not on the score sheet, uh, threatening to get on the score sheet. I didn't really see that from their bottom, uh, their their middle six lines there. Speaking, I mean, you, you mentioned three forward lines there, so it's only natural that we segue into more the the individual skaters of, of Springfield. And you know, let's dive a little bit deeper into that, shall we? This was likely the last weekend for the Scott Prunovich pain tour. <laughs> Like uh, like we labeled last episode, the Prunovich farewell tour, as it was. So 
Sean, what did you see from the uh, the rehabbing Perunovic this weekend? I mean, he danced around four checkers and got transition started at least a dozen times this weekend for Springfield. And that's a huge, like, Co- there is not a- shocked at all. <laughs> oh, yeah. Like, it, yeah. Wasn't sh- it wasn't shocking to see him do it. But at the same point, it was fun to watch him just, sure. oh, you're going to try and put pressure on me? Bye. Oh, you're here to try to? Bye. Like, it was, <laughs> it was very entertaining to watch him just dance around fools. Uh, and he did that a bunch this weekend. He'd also freeze defenders in the offensive zone too, stare them down, looking to shoot, then dish to the side. Um, him doing that creates space for his teammates because he's not tipping his hand. Your other your other defenders can't start attacking the guy you're going to pass because they don't know what's going there yet. Um, he set guys up multiple times in good places, but they just couldn't finish for him. Couldn't get him uh, more than one assist on the weekend. I think it was his first uh, game this weekend. He was held without a point, uh, but you know. It happens. Uh, he still played outstanding. There's a tiny chance he might get a game uh, this week before the, uh, his conditioning stint expires. I, I doubt it. I'm just saying it is possible. Uh, he could technically be in Springfield up to, I want to say, the 1st of March. But I doubt that's how it plays out. I, I'm, I feel pretty confident he's going to go back. Uh, if not, you know, by the end of the day. Uh, on Monday, which is when we're recording. So if he's not, you know, already having the paperwork drawn up to come back to St. Louis, um, I I would be surprised to see him stick around there anymore. One thing that did stand out this weekend, though, in a big way, uh, was the difference between Charlie Lindgren and Joel Hoffer playing the puck. Um, When Lindgren gets the puck, he's looking for his teammates, uh, and he's looking to turn these exchanges, by and large, into non-events. He'll either just stop it for the defenseman, kind of leave it teed up behind the net there, or he'll make a kind of routine pass tape to tape to one of them, and play goes on. And that's what these exchanges should be 95% of the time, unless your goalie is coming like way out to play a cleared puck or something like that. Uh, and he's trying to make like a, you know, dish into the neutral zone, which I'm fine with that, but do it at the right moments if you're a goaltender. Um, but like the behind the net kind of stopping rim arounds and stuff. He's looking for teammates when he gets those pucks and just trying to make a simple play or leave the puck for them and have that be it. That is not what it looks like Joel Hoffer is doing. He seems, on the other hand, to be looking for opponents when he touches the puck and is just trying to fire the puck away from opponents, which, yeah, that's one way of doing it. But the problem is, is he's just going with these like hard rim around the glass kind of plays And yeah, if you're shooting it away from the other team, that's fine. But you're also making it more difficult because the puck's trying to feel the puck if you're one of those teammates that's coming around the glass like that is actually really hard. And if your teammates are struggling to recover those passes, that's not great. You want these these exchanges to be non-events. And there were a couple of moments too where he'd also just kind of blindly backhand one where he's like, I see a four checker coming this way. I'm just going to blindly put it the other way. And yeah, like that's usually going to work for you. But against Wooksbury Scranton, it almost cost them a goal because he blindly put it a back uh, a backhand, and a Wooksbury Scranton dude was there and got a shot on net, you know, right as he was getting back in. That's something that the coaching staff or Lindgren should work with him on because Hofer trying to just rifle shots off the glass isn't helping anyone, and in some cases is actively hurting the team. Lastly. I don't want to, but I feel like there's enough here on Tyler Tucker to be concerned. He's decent in his own end, maybe above average. He can win battles in corners and at the net front in his own zone. He has a hard shot, but he uses it poorly. And that's really it. His skating isn't improving and is still kind of below average. His processing speed in the offensive zone is incredibly limiting. And he might not be able to do more right now than rim the puck around or take low percentage shots from long range when he gets the puck at the at the point in the offensive zone. Yes, he's a seventh round pick and still very young. But at this point, I would want to be seeing movement forward from him. And I'm just not. He looks pretty much the same from last year where he was very rough around the edges. Now he's still just a, an older version of that. And... That's concerning, especially because he's still playing a lot of minutes for them, and I don't think he's being very productive in them. Are you surprised he's up at the AHL level and maybe not down in the ECHL? Part of me thinks that 
he should maybe be down at the ECHL level just to like, especially to like processing speed. The AHL is not going to get any slower for you. That's for sure. So that would be something I would want to send you down to focus on the pace of the game and making sure that when you're making moves in the offensive zone, you're not feeling rushed. You know where you're going, that kind of thing. I don't think you're going to like advance in that skill in a trial by fire of just continuing to put you in environments where you're not able to process. I think you need to learn, you know, at a slower pace first and then be able to slowly step up. Like when they first teach you to drive and it seems like cars, you know, in school zones are flying. Um, they, they don't send you on the highway. <laughs> no, that's a yeah. pretty apt. Uh, that's a pretty apt comparison there. That's I like, like that. I would definitely be willing to send him down because if he's going to advance beyond what he is now of just defensive defenseman who's mean and have a shot to, you know, at least if nothing else, play better AHL moment or have better AHL moments or stuff like that, or a better AHL career. I, I think in the right circumstances, he could go down to the ECHL, uh, but that also means I have to trust the ECHL coach that they'll play him and develop him and do what we talk about, which. So it's, I, I would want to like me personally, I obviously don't know Tyler Tucker. So I would want to have more of a relationship with him and feel like how I could explain why we're sending you there. Like we want you to develop this specific part of your game because it's not working right now at the AHL. Like he's still an AHL defenseman, but he's like a number five. And if he wants to be a number three or a number two, then this is what he needs to fix. And he's not going to be able to fix it at this speed. Yeah. And the fact that St. Louis doesn't have an ECHL affiliate anymore, at least an official yeah. one. That's yeah. That's <laughs> not very material in my eyes. Like send that's him to, fair. I mean, there's what, like six of them that are around the Springfield area, you know, within a couple hours drive. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, that's whatever fair. one you want to send him to. It doesn't matter. <laughs> I guess I'm just used to, again, covering Idaho for two years, being, you know, 100 million miles away from Texas. And anyway, all right, well, let's talk about the future. Let's look to the horizon for the Springfield Thunderbirds. What do they have coming down the pike since we've uh, moved on from this weekend? Well, the Thunderbirds head to a standard three and four this week on Wednesday, Friday, Saturday, all of them at home, all of them against different opponents, which always makes it tough as now you have to prepare for three separate teams that play three different ways. Uh, Bridgeport is Wednesday's game at 7.05. Again, all of these Mass Mutual Center. Uh, after starting the season playing Bridgeport a ton, Springfield has only played the Sound Tigers once in 2022. Uh, a 4-3 to loss on the island of Connecticut. They are 7-2 and two against the Sound Tigers this season, but again, some of those games feel like a very long time ago. So, uh, Friday's game is against Hartford. After losing the first three in the series to the Wolfpack, the Thunderbirds are 5-4 and four on the season. Uh, Hartford will have a rest advantage in this game as they don't play during the week, so this will be their first game since this past weekend, whereas they play Bridgeport on Wednesday. Should carry over, you know, some fatigue. Saturday's opponent is Charlotte. Springfield is 2-1 and one against the Checkers this year. Charlotte will be playing its second game of a 3-3, three and three, so they have a rest advantage in theory that this will only be the second game of, you know, their week so far, whereas it will be Springfield's third, but they also have another game to play on after this on Sunday. So there might be some, I got to make sure in my head, I'm keeping fresh for the next game we have to play. But um, that is where uh, Springfield heads after this weekend in the week ahead. I think that's all we have for Springfield. Any closing thoughts from you? Nope. No, nothing for me. Yeah, you, I, you go ahead. I do like this jersey a lot, though, too. I don't usually like the kind of piping uh, on some of these, but it looks mm -hmm. good. I, I like the, the two-tone. So, Yeah, and I think that it, it, pulling off a red jersey when it's not really like a – I mean, Springfield doesn't really have a primary – like color. I mean, you've got the blue head of, you know, the Thunderbird, I guess, as it were, but like, yeah, you've got the yellow and I, I yeah, I mean, if you're going to use a color for a jersey, you would think maybe they would use blue, but I, but with them going with red, I think it was a good choice. It's a very handsome jersey. I also like too that there's more than one tone to it. Like it's not just red, blue, white, which is mm -hmm. the color scheme of, uh, seems like a million sports teams these days. I think the the lighter blue helps offset that and give it kind of a, a more unique feel. I do like it. Yeah. All right. Well, 
now that we're done gushing about Springfield's jersey, which is very attractive, we are going to take a break here. And after our brief break, <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna go to Toronto and Belleville. And if you're just here for Springfield, we thank you for stopping by. Don't forget to subscribe wherever you're listening to us from so you can get episodes in a timely fashion. Also, check us out on social media, links to our social media, as well as links to our YouTube channel. And popular podcast links can be found at our Linktree page at L-I-N-K-T-R dot E-E slash The Calder Farmstead. Well, Sean's back in Canada, so of course, we've got some bills to pay and travel expenses on the other side of these ads. We'll be right back. Time to go back up north and cover the series that was between the Toronto Marlies and the Belleville Sens. Friday at Belleville, 7 p.m. Eastern. Saturday at Toronto, 4 p.m. Eastern. Uh, yeah, they still use time zones up there in Canada. Don't be too surprised, but uh, <laughs> I know. It's a shocker. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Anyway, goals recap Friday. Sean, take it away. A lot of goals here, so may want to sit down for a minute here. Uh, uh, yeah. Matthew Wedman opens the scoring early in the first period on Friday. Lassie Thompson finds him in the slot after a high cycle. And Wedman backhands one past Michael Hutchinson, one nothing Belleville. The Marlies uh, forecheck whiffs and Logan Shaw heads up on a two-on-two rush where he threads a pass between Carl, Donstr uh, Carl Dahlstrom and Chad Chris to find Mark Kaslick. Kaslick beats Hutchins. Hutchinson's acrobatic save attempt, two nothing Senators just past the halfway point in the first period. The Marlies get one back uh, to start the second, though, as Castle takes a dumb penalty and Philip Kral finds Semyon dur across Royal Road. SDA does his best soft catch, soft catch wrist shot, and it's 2-1. to one. Belleville returns to a two-goal lead as Igor Sokolov picks up a pass in the neutral zone and cuts across the blue line and then walks Philip Crawl and powers a backhand over the glove of Hutchinson to make it 3-1 to one Senators. The Marlies get back to a one-goal deficit as Joseph Dushak catches a stretch pass from Antti Suomela uh, out of the penalty box for a shorthanded breakaway. Sugard makes the save, but Duzak gets the rebound and fires one at the net from a dead angle that somehow sneaks in. 3-2 to two, early in the third period. The Marlies tie it up one minute and one second later off a face-off scrum. The puck finds Joey Anderson in the slot, and he roofs one past Sogard. Tie game at three with 17-12 left in the third period. The Marlies cannot complete the comeback as a brief battle with along the left half wall in the defensive zone. The Marlies penalty killers fail to reset and leave Igor Sokolov and Robbie uh, Roby Yarventie all alone in the slot. Hutchinson makes the initial save, but the rebound trickles behind him. Sokolov finds it and slams it home. That would be all the scoring. Four to three Belleville is your final on Friday. On Saturday, we scored a bunch of goals again. Uh, Mark Kaslick gets the B-Sends on the board uh, first with the tiniest of tips on a shot from along the wall by Logan Shaw. One to nothing uh, Belleville, 13-33 left in the first period. Mark Kaslick is certainly making himself visible as he catches a stretch pass from Colby Williams. Kaslick gains the zone, pulls up, and hits a seam pass, a seam pass three Marley's defenders to find Logan Shaw in the slot, and Shaw puts one low blocker to make it 2-0 Belleville with just under nine minutes left in the first. The Marlies are down 2-0 once again, but battle back in the second period as a point shot from Christians Rubens is stopped by the Mandalizian, but the rebound sits in the slot where Semyon Dargachinsov swings by and taps it to Nick Robertson, who wins a battle in the slot over Rourke Chardier and rifles it home. 2-1 sends just over two minutes into the second period. The Senators respond 18 seconds later as Andrew Agazzino tips a Jake Lucchini shot on the rush past Eric Schalgren to make it 3-1 to one Senators. Andrew Shaw makes a bad turnover behind his net and, and his pass is broken up by Antti Suomelo and Suomelo backhands one past Schalgren to make it 3-2. to two. Belleville catches the Marlies in transition with a 4-on-2 rush chance. Roby Yarventier plays catch across Royal Road with Michael Delzato, and Delzato catches the return and wrists one past the sprawling Chagrin to make it 4-2 Belleville, seven and a half minutes left in the second. Just over a minute into the third period, a weird bounce in the neutral zone springs the Marlies for a three-on-one. Semyon Dargachinsev takes the feed from Nick Robertson and rips one past the blocker of Kevin Mandulis. A one-goal game with plenty of time left. Mac Hollowell dodges a check from Chris Wilkie, then lifts his stick and taps a pass through his legs to Alex Steves. Steves corrals the pass and fires a wrister low glove side that sneaks past Mandelis to tie the game at four with 10-25 in the third period. 
In overtime, Igor Sokolov recovers a loose puck in the Marley zone and gets it to Agazino. Agazino fires a wrister that hits the post and it comes right to Sokolov and he buries it in the open net and seals it. Belleville sweeps the weekend with a 5-4 to four win. Sean, I think you should get some bonus points, not just for all those goals you covered, but all those names you had to pronounce. That was a... <laughs> yeah, there is a, a large collection of challenging names on, on those two Ontario teams. Uh, but anyways, you did see, it, we did make some picks here. They uh, We are once again only half right. Tell me about them. Yes, so I was bullish on Toronto and picked the Marlies in both games. Uh, Sean, you said capacities increased in both cities means more fans, means probably a greater home ice advantage. You picked Belleville on Friday and Toronto on Saturday. And uh, the model said Toronto in both games, 50.9% favorite in Belleville on Friday, 53.4% favorite in Toronto on Saturday. So me and the model in cahoots. Yes. I do want to point out that I think I was wrong about Toronto uh, raising okay. attendance capacities because there were definitely people in the building in Belleville, but at least from the overhead shots I could see in Toronto didn't look like anyone was there. So I may, hmm. you know, have not read the uh, official statement from the, you know, Ontario government about those correctly, or I might've missed the date or something, but it didn't look like they had really anyone in the building at all. So might've been wrong about that one. Which, I mean, yeah, hindsight in 2020, that probably wouldn't have changed my pick. But at the same point, here we are. Here we are. You were the only one that picked correct out of, you know, you, me, and the model. So you picked Belleville on Friday. They swept the weekend. Me and the model picking Toronto sweeps. We were wrong. We were wrong, wrong, wrong. But anyway, not the weekend series between these two that we thought it would be by any means. That's for sure. Let's start with Friday's game, however. How did Belleville pull off a win? In Friday's game. Well, we said in the series preview that uh, the team that scores first has won each of these games so far this season. Uh, for the most part, that was Toronto, and the Marlies had outshot, outchanced, and outscored the Senators in five of seven first periods. So our big key to the weekend for the Senators was to win the first period. Uh, the other key to the weekend was to get the power play going, as they were one for 28 on the power play against the Marlies. Belleville outshot and outchanced and outscored the Marlies in the first period on Friday. And they scored a power play goal. Um, I'm still not a fan of how Belleville runs their power play as the goal that T10 scored on the power play was certainly fluky. A weird blown coverage from the Marlies and the puck kind of just trickling, you know, behind Hutchinson before Sokolov taps it in. They had to review it, uh, especially after like Belleville didn't do much on their other power plays. But hey, they don't ask how, they ask how many. And Belleville did put in a power play goal. They, you know, outshot, outchanced, outscored the Marlies in the first period. They got that first goal. So those are all three of the things that we said Belleville needed to do to come out with W's in this game. That's pretty much how Belleville came out, came out with W's in this game. Um, Friday, though, had the Senators also dominate neutral zone play for a pretty good period of uh, the game uh, through sh big stretches in the first and second period. I thought they were walking through the Marlies forecheck in the first period and keeping the Marlies from doing the same. Um, in both the games, though, the Senators took their foot off the gas with a two-goal lead and kind of tried to do what Rockford does a bunch and just play lockdown defense in front. I think that's a mistake against a team that's as talented and well-coached as the Marlies. And yes, Belleville swept the weekend, but they very much flirted with disaster in both games. Let's be clear on that one. Um, the other really interesting note from Friday's game and the weekend on the whole in this series is that the Senators use a hybrid 2-1-2, 2-3 offense uh, off the cycle in both games. They didn't set up the cycle too many times, but when they did, they were very clearly using this. Now, we've talked about this very briefly in other places before, but what makes this interesting is, and I'm not positive about this first point, but I don't think the Senators have been doing this all season. I think they played the system that Ottawa runs, which is not this. Ottawa does not run this system, the 2-1-2 slash 2-3. You know who does, though? Who? Toronto. Oh, the Maple Leafs or the Marlies? Both. Oh. Both the Maple Leafs and the Marlies run this, which <laughs> makes this very fun, as that would mean Belleville diverged from the offense their parent club runs, copied what Toronto has been doing, and then beat them while using it. 
I don't know about you, but that's funny to me. That is literally beating a team at their own game. Like yes. that is taking their strategy and employing it against against like, your opponent. And again, Belleville didn't get too many good cycles set up this weekend. It seemed like primarily most of their goals came through broken rush chances or kind of broken plays in the zone. But when they did, you can look at the replays and see this is them setting up this offense that Toronto runs, that Ottawa does not, which, man, <laughs> like I said, I think that's amusing. I agree. That's <laughs> Amusing is a good word for it, for sure. All right, so one of the few Friday-Saturday two-game sets that we had this weekend, it felt like 75% of the league, 80% of the league had the Saturday-Sunday thing going on uh, this weekend. So with that said, let's transition over to Saturday. Was there anything different about Saturday's game from Friday's? Oh, for sure. Saturday's game was much more wide open, a lot more north-south boat race style, if that makes sense. Uh, both teams flying through the neutral zone for most of the game. Um, Toronto had some moments where their forecheck was uh, getting home in the neutral zone, getting turnovers. But for the most part, very back and forth, trade rush chances kind of game, which is fun. This did end up feeling a little bit like a goalie duel uh, once Belleville retook its two goal lead in the second period. Uh, as like once Belleville retook the two goal lead in the second period, they tried to shut it down. Uh, Toronto dominated possession and scoring chances till there from the end. But when they made a mistake, it was a capital M kind of mistake, and Belleville pounced upon, pounced on it. Both teams scored kind of fluky goals, but both goaltenders also made huge saves that were critical to sending this game to overtime. Uh, Sokolov and Chartier both had breakaways that Chagrin stopped. Mandelis came up big on a few odd man rushes. Five to four doesn't really sound like a goalie duel kind of score. You usually think of that as a, a one nothing, two one kind of game. But there were definitely elements of it in this game as both made a bunch of stops on grade A chances again and again. Um, honestly, I thought the home team was better in both of these games. I thought Belleville was better in Belleville. I thought Toronto was better in Toronto. But Belleville took advantage of big mistakes that the Marlies def- defense made and got some good bounces, like that OT winner. I mean, right off the post, right into Sokolov's you know, stick, right in the net. Like, I could have put that one in. And I'm terrible <laughs> at hockey. Huh. Well, let's uh, let's dive into the individuals now. Um, good for good or for bad, who stood out to you on the ice this weekend? On the Belleville side, I'm definitely seeing improvement from Igor, Igor Sokolov's skating. Um, again, I doubt he'll ever be a burner, but he's definitely added a step. He won a foot race for a breakaway on Saturday's game, and if and that's not something I think he could have done last season with the speed he had. We might have to start researching some more mobile Russian tanks uh, to update the T10 nickname. I feel like I could also say the same thing about Roby Yarventier's skating. Uh, he's really progressed a lot. It looks like he's added a step. His edge work's gotten a little bit better. Another one that I don't think is ever going to be a burner, but he's still 19 years old. All the pieces aren't there yet, but he very much has a path uh, as a useful NHLer in maybe a year or two. Um, I could also see him not having that path in Ottawa, but that's a story for a different time. Chris Wilkie, on the other hand, I feel like is still struggling heavily to get to the inside and to create from there. Um, A few times he just skates himself to the perimeter and was easily defended. Um, And that's not a good sign for his game going forward. Mark Kaslik definitely did more good than bad this weekend, uh, but if nothing else, he was noticeable all the time. You knew when Mark Kaslik was on the ice. Good or bad, he was doing stuff. Um, and this season, like, or sorry, his season last year definitely didn't do his like stock any favors. Uh, but he's looked like he's taken a leap forward this year. And while he's start, starting to run out of runway as a prospect, like the leaps forward I've seen from this year and him being noticeable, him making offensive progressions, him being physical, that's very, that's, that's a good signpost for his game. Um, if I were Ottawa, I'd be looking to try and, you know, see if I can s- sneak in another two-year, like, league min kind of deal. Like a two-year, a two-year, first year is two-way, second year is one-way, kind of like, all right, by the time you're 25, 26 at the end of this deal, we should know exactly what we have in you. And if it's not what we like, we let you walk. I think that's where Mark Kastlik is heading. 
On the Marley side, Philip Crawl continues to impress in moments and then disappoint in others. I mean, he's definitely got NHL qualities to him. He's great skater, good puck skills. I mean, he walked Lassie Thompson in Friday's game, burned right around him to the point where I actually had to change the broadcast because the broadcaster kept referring it to it as a minor league move. And I'm like, I can't with this anymore. Let's I'll listen to the Marley's guy. It's fine. Um, it was not, uh, David, it wasn't footy by the way. Footy's great. I like footy, but mm-hmm. I don't know whoever this dude was did not like him, but, um, I see moments on defense with Philip crawl where he just gets sloppy. He's not engaged, gives up scoring chances. He's listed at 194 pounds, which is a perfectly fine size for a professional hockey player but I swear he looks like he's 175 and occasionally gets muscled off pucks. So maybe he doesn't need to gain, you know, size, but it definitely seems like he needs to gain strength. Uh, It's weird to see someone be that lanky and be as heavy as he is. Like he is 15 pounds and quite a few inches on me, but it's like, I look like I am the same general size as him. And that's not, that's not a great thing. I'm glad Brett Seedy responded with a good game on Saturday because right up until the moment in which he was involved on Joey Anderson's goal on Friday, I don't think I realized he was in the game. And that's not great. He did that a lot last year, and that has by and large been not a part of his game this year. Um, He didn't make the score sheet on Saturday, but was much more involved, much more noticeable, uh, doing his usual getting scrums, draw penalties kind of thing, but was still a lot more effective. Uh, but he was a ghost for most of Friday's game. And uh, talking about individual players, um, Josh Hosang, was he back this weekend or is he still coming back from the Olympics? I mean, I assume he's still coming back from the Olympics. Um, I, I heard rumors that like there could be NHL teams offering him like a league men deal because he's on an AHL deal. So um, the, any NHL team could just walk in, you know, walk up to him and be like, Here's a league min NHL contract, you know, what do you say? And he's gone. Like, I imagine Toronto at that point would probably counter offer or do something to keep him uh, or try and, you know, file some tampering grievance or I don't know what. That's that's a part of the CBA that I don't know that well. But I have heard uh, at least, you know, some rumors swirling that there might be teams interested in signing him to a, a two-way NHL deal when he returns. But he was not there this weekend, though. No. Gotcha. Okay. I... I mean, closing ceremonies haven't happened yet, right? That's like today or tomorrow, or I, I think that was today. It was or today. yesterday, okay. even. Yeah. Yeah. So if that's the case, I mean, I don't know. That's a that's a very individualistic thing. Of like, when your team is like, when your event is done, if you lost, do you stay for the rest of it just to like uh, closing ceremonies and everything, or do you just bounce out? I mean, yeah, yeah I think like, it, it it depends. I, I think in these circumstances with, you know, if I test positive for COVID, I have to, I'm stuck in China for two more weeks. I think in those very specific ones, as soon as I'm done, I don't care if we won or lost, I am not risking sticking around and finding out if I can test positive for COVID before I have to leave. So like yeah. that would be my answer in different, in regular circumstances where the, this isn't a, a problem. I don't know. I'm real competitive. I hate losing. Losing sucks. Like it drives me crazy, even in things that aren't competitive. So I could see me not wanting to like hang out for the rest of my, the time there and watch other people celebrate knowing that I failed. I would want to come back early, but if I won, I'd probably stick around. (laughs) That's fair. That's completely fair. All right, CC. That's the rear view mirror of what happened. Let's look through the windshield. Where do uh, both of these teams go from here? Better to look through the windshield than go through the windshield, as I always say. But uh, the Marlies had a Monday game against the Laval Rocket in Toronto. They won 6-2. to two. Toronto is then going to host the Rocket again on Wednesday. Uh, Toronto will host Laval on Wednesday night before heading to a weekend home-and-home home series against Rochester Saturday and Sunday. Against the Vol- against Laval, the Marlies are one and three in their only with their only win coming uh, on Monday afternoon. Saturday's game is on the road in Rochester and starts at 2 35 PM while Sunday's game in, is in Toronto with a 4 PM start time. So have fun with that turnaround. Yeah. yeah. HL schedule. Got to squeeze those games in there somehow. Well, they have um, to get the Mar- before it closes. 
Yeah, that too. <laughs> Got to get to Canada before it closes. The Mollies have won two straight against Rochester and are two and one on the season against the Amherst. Belleville has a similar four in six schedule with a Monday game against Syracuse that ended in a six to two loss. They host Syracuse again Tuesday night at 7 p.m. They are two and three against the Crunch this season, having dropped the last two games to them. Belleville has a Friday Saturday set against. The Rocket in Laval, Friday is at 7 p.m. Saturday is at 3 p.m. Nice little Saturday matinee there. Belleville has a 5-2 and two record this season against the Rocket, having won four straight by a combined score of, are you ready for this, 24-8 in those last four games. That seems more like a American football score, maybe even Canadian football score um, since they're up there in Canada, but uh 24 to 8 in those last four games. That's the goal that they have there. the two point conversion in Canadian football. I don't actually know the answer to that. I don't think so. Now you okay. got me curious. I want to look it up. CFL two point conversion. Right. I will uh, take us to break here. Uh, we are going to head to okay. break. Uh, after the break, we will go to the Central Division and talk about the Griffins and Ice Hogs weekend. If you're just here for the Marlies and Senators, thank you for stopping by. Don't forget to subscribe wherever listening to us from. Uh, Also check us out on social media, links to all of that and more. Our social media, uh, our podcast places, all the things like that and more, uh, you can find at our Linktree page at l-i-n-k-t-r dot e-e slash the Calder Farmstead. Cece, do they have the two-point conversion? They had the two-point conversion well before the NFL did, actually. Really? Good for you. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Well, there's your fun fact as we had to break. We're going to pay some bills. We will be right back. We're done recapping the weekend that was in the Eastern Conference. We're going to head over to the Western Conference and, of course, to the first division that we always cover, whether we're previewing or recapping, the Central Division. Grand Rapids versus Rockford. Home and home. Saturday at Grand Rapids, 7 Eastern. Sunday at Rockford for Central. Shawnee, we had some goals. Who did I think we? we sh- I, I think we should recap them, shall we? That sounds good. Yeah. Saturday, Ryan Murphy opens the scoring just 22 seconds in the game as he takes a pass from Joe Valeno and makes a nice fake to get Colin Dealey to bite, then rips one past Dealey to make it one nothing Griffins. The Ice Hogs start the second period off with a bang, though, as Wyatt Kalniuk leads the rush to the neutral zone, gains the offensive blue line, and then just rips one past Calvin Picker to tie it at one just, what, uh, just a minute uh, into the second period, just under a minute into the second period. Colin Delia makes a save on Tyler Spezia's shot, but can't control the rebound. And John Martin knocks one, uh, knocks in the rebound to make it two to one Griffins. Another goal within the minute of the period starting as the Griffins defense loses Cameron Morris, uh, as the Griffins defense loses uh, Cameron Morris in the shuffle of play. Evan Barrett finds him at the back door and he taps it in tie game at two. A beautiful stretch pass from Jarek McIsaac springs Luke Witkowski on a breakaway and he backhands one past Colin Deliot for a three to two lead 16 34 left to go in the third period. Colin Delia runs into white Kalnuck who's engaged with Dominic, uh, Dominic shine. Kyle Chris uh, throws one in the net when he sees Delia down Delia makes a stay, but shine gets free and taps home the rebound four to two Griffins. Taro Hiroshi hits the empty net to seal it five to two Griffins is your final on Saturday. Sunday. Right off a blown faceoff coverage by the Griffins, Dylan McLaughlin finds Brett Connolly in the slot and he puts it in. one nothing Griffins, or sorry, one nothing Ice Hogs with just over four minutes left in the first period. Not even 30 seconds later, Mike Hardman gets a tip, on the, a tip at the net from an Ian Mitchell shot for a power play goal and it's 2 nothing Ice Hogs. Cale Morris makes a misread on a behind-the-back pass by Joe Valeno and is out of position for Jared McIsaac's shot that blows past him. Two to one Ice Hogs, just over 15 minutes left in the second period. As the last seconds of a Griffins power play tick off the clock, Rockford's exhausted penalty killers can't make the stop as Dennis Yan works the puck from the half wall to the bumper spot for Tyler Spezia. Spezia turns and fires one past Kale Morris to tie the game. While Kalnuck gets stripped of the puck by Tyler Spezia in the defensive zone, Spezia comes back, uh, comes around the back of the net and finds Jonathan Bergrion, who fires one past Kale Morris. Griffins take the lead 3-2. to two. Turner Ellison strips Alti Barmakian in the neutral zone and finds Joe Valeno. Valeno has space entering the offensive zone and rifles a shot from uh, the top of the circle past Kale Morris to make it 4-2 Griffins. Turner Ellison hits the empty net to seal it. 
for another five to two win for your Grand Rapids Griffins. <laughs> CC, we made picks. They were not correct. Uh, at least my Saturday pick was correct. I, I went with home cooking. I went with the Griffins at home on Saturday and the Ice Hogs at home on Sunday. Uh, you and the model, however, picking the Ice Hogs sweeps and uh, the Griffins decide to flip the script and say, well, I think we'll take these two games. So I will say one of the factors in my decision was there was a number retirement in Grand Rapids that night. And oh. teams never win banner raising games ever, ever. Mm -hmm. Like that is the one like stupid superstition thing that I will take with me to every bet that I make. Is like, oh, is the team that won the Calder Cup, Stanley Cup, whatever, you know, raising a retirement number, uh, always bet against them every time. Like, they're, they never, I swear, it sounds really silly, doesn't it? They don't win. Tampa didn't win either when it raised its banner. Like, they don't win. They don't win those games. And yet here we are, Grand Rapids, breaking the a very long streak of wins uh, for me. But you can't bet on the AHL, so... Okay, so the last, real quick, the last Jersey retirement I remember is when the Dallas Stars in late January retired Sergei Zuboff's number. Did they win that game? I don't know. I know that uh, the Wild beat the Rangers on Henrik Lundqvist retirement number night. That was uh, like a week before that. Okay. Um, oh, and I great. bet on the yeah. Wild that night. So Gotcha. Anyway. Of course. Let's uh, anyway. yes, back to we're the gonna move and where we're supposed to be here. Yeah, sorry. Getting distracted by number retirements here. Two five to two games, but two very different feels to them. Let's start with Saturday's game. How did Grand Rapids pull this one out? Rockford's strategy this season has been getting early leads, then going into lockdown mode where they defend high danger areas, keep shots to the outside, keep a clean environment for their goaltenders so they can just make saves and move on. Uh, Rockford controlled the flow of this game pretty well in the first period for most of the second two. But Grand Rapids getting that first goal, uh, answering back every time Rockford tied it to prevent them from really be, to be able to execute that strategy. Uh, they also got a very awkwardly bad game from Colin Delia, who looked like he was struggling with his movement, depth, timing, all over the place. Uh, very uncharacteristic game from Colin Delia. He was way out of his crease on Ryan Murphy's goal. I mean, he was at like the bottom of the faceoff circles when Murphy shot. Um Fails to control a rebound on a Tyler Spezia shot, knowing that John Martin is literally standing right in front of him. Um, basically runs into his own defenseman trying to make the save and kind of flops over. Not this is and this game's not on all on Delia, by the way. Uh not by not by any means. The Ice Hogs did not play a great game in front of him and gave up a lot more quality chances than we'd seen them in the previous two games. Um they played a pretty good two periods, you know. I thought they were controlling most of the flow of the play, but they gave up chances. They fell apart in the third period in a tie game, and you can't expect to do that and win. Um, also, not having your best goaltender in Arvid Soderblom and your best skater in Lucas Reichel, uh, have them for the weekend, that's always going to be a downer as well. So those, plus Delia didn't play that well, plus you fell apart in the third, that's how Grand Rapids pretty much walked away with this one. Um, but it was a, a competitive game for two and a half periods, I'd say. So... Another five to two game on Sunday. <laughs> Again, like I like I said, it was a different feel in both games. So what felt different about this one, Sean? Well, for one, the Ice Hogs never had a lead in Saturday's game. And on Sunday, they accomplished the get girls or get girl get goals early part of the strategy. Uh, they were up two nothing at the end of the first period. You know, put in two quick ones at the end of the first. However, they got into a lot of penalty trouble. And while we sang the praises of their penalty kill in the previous episode, it did not have that same level of intensity that did in previous games. Um, getting into penalty trouble often, too, means that you're not going to generate much offense. You're not going to get a lot of momentum. It breaks up your kind of offensive flow and that kind of thing. Uh, and that's definitely what happened to them in this game. It also looks like the Ice Hogs just ran out of gas in the last half of the game. Um, both sides looked tired. But the Griffins power through, whereas Rockford straight stopped skating in moments. Um, you could see fatigue in them, which was weird because, like, yeah, you know, these are uh, human athletes. They had to both get on the bus after Saturday's game and go back to to Rockford for Sunday's game. Uh, so that's never fun. But at the same point, like, it's just a back to back. So this wasn't like a three and four or a three and three where you definitely be like, all right, at the end, you're going to be exhausted. It doesn't matter how superhumanly conditioned you are. Uh, but yeah, Rockford definitely looked just 
out of gas. Like they didn't sleep well as a team the night before. Uh, Cause right around the middle of the second period, it looked like they were just, they were going through the motions. Um, Kale Morris also did not play well. Uh, three of the four, <clears throat> three of the four, he let up very much on him. Uh, that first power play goal, he mess he misread Joe Valeno and wasn't in position at all to make that save on Jared McIsaac. A um, couple of the others too, like uh, Valeno's goal. I mean, that was a stare down. It's just him in the offensive zone. And he beats you. Uh, that's that's not a good one to give up. Um, now, Kel Morris also hasn't played in two weeks, and this was his second game played this calendar year in 2022. So it's not shocking that he was a bit rusty. I think it's been well documented that Kale Morris is someone I think has talent and could be a starter at the AHL level. But right now, the Ice Hogs either need to find a way to get in in games, whether that's in the ECHL or in the AHL, or they need to find a place to send him because this isn't working out for either side here where he's playing two games in two months. And we don't have injury reports. So if you're telling me he's injured again, that's great. But I don't know that because there are no injury reports. There, The only one I know of is Rockford. Rockford will be the only one, the only organization in the AHL that will tell you. Really? Yeah. I get I, emails on injury reports and stuff. From I saw – that's not true, actually. I saw one from Laval yesterday. A bona fide from the team, this guy is hurt. He's going to be out this long. I, what? I <laughs> do you about fall out of your chair? <laughs> I did. It was uh so, someone in the Laval Facebook group posted it, and I was just like, "Is this even legal?" And he goes, "Yeah, wow. yeah, it's from the team." And I'm like, "I just assumed if you filed an injury report in the AHL, the ghost of Eddie Shore just came swooping in and took it." But like, <laughs> it was legitimately from the team website, an injury report detailing like. This guy is hurt. It's upper lower body. We expect him back in roughly this timeline. I was like, is it my birthday? Is it Christmas? Am I going to get blacklisted for from the AHL for reading? The, yeah. But yeah, like if if you're telling me that Cam Morris has been hurt all of that time, then I, yeah, you can't play the guy that's hurt. But like, it does seem like he's just kind of hanging out there. And mm. that's not good for someone who's trying to develop. You know, he's still a youth. And it's not good for him to be sitting and not working on his game. Cause when you put him back in after two weeks off, uh, he looks like that. That's not good. Positive or negative or both. Let's dive a little deeper into more individual skaters and players who stood out to you at the player level this weekend, uh, during the grand Rapids and Rockford series. So, uh, speaking of injuries here, I think my idea that Jarek, uh, Jared McIsaac earlier this year was right uh, that he wasn't fully healthy earlier this year. And it was whatever was wrong with him was clearly affecting his performance because he looks so much better mm. skating smoother, more heads up plays uh, looks like he's, you know, ready to be physically engaged and be a professional hockey player again. I mean, he looked like the Jared Isaac, Jared McIsaac that I remembered now, fingers crossed that his bad injury luck uh, that those days are over and behind him because he certainly had his more his uh, he certainly had more than his fair share of them. I haven't seen many Red Wings games this season, but man, I struggle to believe that Joe Valeno isn't capable of being at least a fourth line player on that team. He looks like a lot of others do when they're sent down. He looks angry, <laughs> and that's good because he's taking it out on other teams. That kid has a lot of talent, and I think he wields it pretty well. And yet here we are. I. I I don't know what more he's supposed to be doing at this point at the AHL level. Cause he's another one that does not belong here. And for some reason cannot hold down a job in the Red Wings organization. Part of me wonders if this may be, you know, the beginning of the end for Joe Valeno's time in Detroit, but that I, I struggle to believe he's not, you know, that he is the 14th best forward on the Red Wings organization right now. I, I really, I don't get that. Mm. <sighs> In general, I don't have that high opinion of Tyler Spezia. He's a depth scorer that disappears for like weeks at a time. But he was good this weekend. He was involved. He was everywhere on the ice. He was doing things in all three zones. And that's not something that's been true of him throughout many a point in his season. So to see that from him was good. On the Rockford side, yeah, it's hard to come up with much when you lost two games five to two one of which you looked exhausted during as a team and the other you fell apart in the third period so 
yeah. I liked what I saw from Dylan McLaughlin, but I don't think his season includes or his ceiling includes anything more than injury replacement cups of coffee in the show. If that, um, I said it last time and I'll say it again. Curtis Gabriel seems like a good human being off the ice, uh, but I have no idea what he adds to this team on the ice. He's just getting into penalty trouble and not really contributing much else. Um, some good moments from Wyatt, Ky- uh, Wyatt Kalnyuk was good to see him more engaged with the offense the consistency of which has not been great this season, but that's something. He's being more involved, making more plays uh, on the offensive side of the puck. Some very rough defensive moments from him, though, that just cannot happen. Uh, getting stripped like that by Spezia that led to the goal was one of the most half-assed plays uh, I've seen from a team this year. Uh, that was that was not a good moment for him. Well, that was the weekend that was for both Grand Rapids and Rockford. Let's look ahead to the future and let's see what awaits both the Griffins and the Ice Hogs. All right. Grand Rapids heads to Cleveland to play the Monsters uh, on Wednesday before hosting the Bakersfield Condors Friday and Saturday, the 25th and 26th. Even in the North Division again, the Monsters are no stranger to the Griffins. Uh, Grand, Rapids has, Grand Rapids has earned points in all three games playing against Cleveland this season. They are 2-1. and one. Uh against the monster and have posted a 70% win rate against the monsters in 2021 and went seven and three. Uh, the monsters were on a nine game losing streak before winning two of the last three uh, played versus Utica and Charlotte mm. Bakersfield and grand Rapids have only played each other uh, on December 13th and 14th, 2019 in California with the Griffins winning six to five in overtime of the game on the 13th and Bakersfield taking a two, one matchup the next night on the 14th. So it's been a while since uh, either side has seen each other. So that'll be an interesting one. Uh, the Ice Hogs play three games in three nights, uh, Friday through Sunday. The first game is in Iowa on Friday. The next two hosting Texas at the BMO Center in Rockford. That is a rough bit of travel there. Uh, Iowa has played Rockford three times already in the month of February uh, with a loss on the 4th, a win on the 5th, and a shootout loss on the 15th. The Wild are also coming off a losing weekend and two games set against the Chicago Wolves. Iowa is five and three so far this year against Rockford. Texas blew a multi-goal lead to San Jose on February 19th before losing the Barracuda in a shootout at home. Ever since their postponed game from February 5th in Manitoba, the Stars have drawn a 3-3-2 and record, including a rebound victory against San Jose on the 20th. Texas is 3-2-1 and this season against Rockford. We're going to take a break here. That will be the uh, end of our time with Grand Rapids and Rockford. We will get to Colorado and Abbotsford. If you're just here for the Ice Hogs and or Griffins, thank you for stopping by. Don't forget to subscribe wherever you're listening to us from so you get episodes in a timely fashion. Also check us out on social media. Links to our social media as well as links to our YouTube channel and popular podcast links can be found on our link tree page at linktr.ee slash the Calder Farmstead. We're going to pay some bills, run some ads. We'll be right back. Stay tuned. All right. We have one more deep dive series to cover. And Sean, I think, uh, I think it'd be fair that uh, you introduce this series. Yeah. Uh, we are headed to the best coast here to talk about the Colorado Eagles and the Abbotsford Canucks weekend series. This is a Saturday, Sunday uh, game in Saturday, Sunday weekend in Colorado Saturday, 7.05, Sunday, matinee time, 3 o'clock. We had some goals that got scored. CC, why don't you tell me about them? Saturday, I was there in the press box. Abbotsford starting off the scoring in the second period after Carson Folk backhanded a cross-ice pass to Will Lockwood. Lockwood rang a shot off the crossbar. The puck deflected off the boards on the other side of the ice to Ashton Sautner. Sautner fired a slap shot with out and in, out of position, scoring at 5-12 of the second. The Abbey Nucks added another one on a botched pass from Keaton Middleton to Roland McCune behind the net. Sheldon Dries, former Colorado Eagles forward, collected the puck, then backhanded it out in front to Phil DiGiuseppe for an easy goal at 17-47 of period number two. 2-0 two Abbotsford lead. Colorado adds a power play tally, though, from Kiefer Sherwood along the Abbotsford goal line in the 15th minute of the third but that wouldn't be enough to defeat the baby Canucks as the first ever Eagles and Canucks matchup in the history of the AHL goes to Abbotsford two to one. 
Sunday, Sunday, Sunday. First and only goal Saturday was a power play goal from Colorado. So the Eagles decided to start Sunday's game the same. Dylan Secura feeds Martin Count with a short pass in the right face-off circle, the right wing face-off circle, falling to his knees. Count scores a power play goal at 2.23 of the second period. Abbotsford answers in short order with a former Eagles, uh, oh yeah, that one guy, Sheldon Dries. Yep, there's him again. Scoring on a four-on-three power play in tight at 4.44 of period two. One-to-one is the score until Mikhail Maltsev delivers a wraparound shot with authority past Michael DiPetro. <laughs> DiPetro. DiPetro? DiPietro. DiPietro. Thank you. Goodness. We've mispronounced that name so much. Michael Di- DiPietro. Anyways, the, the Malts have goal was by him at 1042 of the second. Abbotsford answers again, though. Guess who? It's Sheldon Dries with another goal. This time a one-timer from the right wing on the power play at 1858 of the second segment of play. In the third period, it's Maltsev again. Breakaway chance. Hits the brakes to psych out a sliding defender. Just keeps on sliding past the goal line. Maltsev fires a shot. DiPietro saves it. Maltsev gets his own rebound. And he risks it home at 16.38 of the third. Add an empty netter from Count, his second on the night. And that is all she wrote. 4-2 to victory for Colorado to split the weekend with the Abbotsford Canucks. And Sean, we made some picks. And I normally cover the picks, but I think it's only fair that you would do it this time. That's fair. That's fair. Yeah. Otherwise, I've been yeah. kind of quiet for a while here. A All right, bit. you took uh, you took Col- or Abbotsford on Saturday, Colorado on Sunday for uh, the correct choices. There, uh, I went uh, for a Nux road sweep. I was feeling myself. Uh, <laughs> the model also went for the Canucks road sweep. Fifty two point one percent favored in both games. We both took one of two. CC, you got them both right on the nose. Very well played. Thank you, sir. Thank you kindly. All right. Well, from a special team side of things, it looks like the Eagles were somewhat successful. Uh, Colorado power play had a goal in each game, uh, one for five and one for three. And the PK held Abbotsford to 0 for four on the man advantage while allowing two power play goals uh, on two chances in the second game. Uh, what did you notice in person from the Eagles special teams? It's easy. <laughs> I mean, it was the power play was pretty bad, actually. Um, you know, the man advantage was just anemic for the first four chances on Saturday night. And guess what? It was like we talked about in the preview episode prior to this one. Even Eagles head coach Greg Cronin, when I talked to him after the game, I asked him about special teams on Saturday night. He said it's, quote, depressing on the bench to watch, end quote, when your power play can't enter the zone cleanly to get set up. And yeah, I mean, Cronin's exact words were, we lost the faceoff, they sent it down, and it was an exercise in futility to set the puck up. I mean, that that's that just colors, that paints you quite a picture there. Exercise in futility. It was extremely rough to witness. Even the scout beside me was cursing at the ineptitude of the Eagles power play using, yeah, profanities. It was bad. It was, he's a, like, what the bleep are you doing? It was, yeah, it was that bad. Our, our analysis uh, on Friday's episode was spot on, unfortunately. And the power play just, yeah, they were one for three on Sunday, which was good. But I mean, it was just, yeah, it was just, when they're, when they're off, they are off and it is not good. So I know we didn't really talk about the penalty kill, but you did ask about special teams. So, man, that first game was damn impressive for a team that has owned a season-long pass for the penalty kill struggle buzz this year. Net penalty kill percentage, by the way, for Colorado is 81.8%. Holding off Abbotsford to an 0 and 4. You know, they're one of the top AHL teams, I believe, in net power play at 19.6%. That's a mighty feat for Colorado to hold them fruitless in four chances. Did the Canucks get some chances on net on Saturday? Yes. Did the Eagles clear up shooting lanes so Eustace Annanen could easily track the puck and make saves much more easily? Double check. Clearing the puck after one or two of those opportunities? Triple check. It was a good formula. They stuck to it. And that's why Abbotsford went 0 for 4 on the man advantage. As for Sunday, oof. Just oof. Four on three where Abbotsford threads the needle to awaiting Sheldon drives on the doorstep. 
Another power play goal allowed on the drives. One timer after a pass across Royal Road. Colorado, those were the only two penalties on the night, and Colorado went over two on the kill. And they needed to harness more of that energy that they had into clogging up the passing lanes as opposed to just opening up the shooting lanes so it would be a little bit easier on Ananen. Um, yeah, the passes were were there. They, they, they didn't disrupt that area in as much as they, you know, opened up those shooting lanes. So, and I mean, to be somewhat fair, uh, four on three, you're, when you are the three t- person of whether it's four on three or five on three, your penalty killing playbook is very, very small. It's like four True. cents. I think we talked about it earlier, uh, either in the preview or something like that, where yeah. it's like, it's get a, a wedge formation in the inner slot you know, everyone make sure you're keeping everything outside, blocking passing lanes across, and then you pray a bunch. That's penalty killing when you are a three-man penalty kill unit. So, like, every time I see teams who give up a, a four-on-three or a five-on-three pow- uh, power play goal against, I'm like, yeah, I mean, that sucks, but, like, there's really not that much you can do. They are going to get scoring chances on you unless they are truly inept at, at executing basic power play structures. So those ones I at least have a little more sympathy for because they're just in there just ain't that much to be done. Um, but let's move on here. Uh, you mentioned Eustace and Noonan was uh, back after going MIA for four games. How did he look in his return? Yeah, I mean Trent Miner and Hunter Miska held down the fort as best as they could. You know, going two and two in those four games where Annan was out, but uh, but he was good. I mean, Cronin, like I literally said, hey, Annan looked good on Saturday night. He goes, yeah, yeah, he looked good. He didn't have a ton of shots. There were a couple of shots that were dangerous, and he was good. And that was all that Cronin had to say is that he was good. He he just didn't have a whole lot of um, didn't have wasn't tested very much on Saturday. I think is what Cronin was alluding to. But uh, yeah, I agree. He wasn't playing lights out or anything. But the goals he let in were either off of railroad passes or chances where the defense completely broke down. You know, allowing those two goals in both games, I I think it was passable. But on 18 shots in that first game, (laughs) I mean, don't get me started on that second goal on Saturday. I I told you about it. Keaton Middleton, Roland McCune passed the puck to Keaton Middleton. Keaton Middleton then returned the pass to McCune behind the net. And I don't think he should have because it was intercepted. It bounced. It took a weird bounce off the boards. Sheldon Dries intercepted it. Andreas Wingerly showed absolutely no defensive awareness. Drives fed the puck behind Wingerly to Giuseppe, all alone in front of the net. But anyway, back to Ananen. Yes, his propensity to get rattled and let in a couple goals that he showcased earlier on in the season, um, it has dwindled significantly. He's gotten, as I've said many times, much more comfortable with the North American game. Um, he's poised when he lets in a goal. He doesn't crumble doesn't fall apart as readily as he used to. He also had 26 saves on 28 shots on goal in the Sunday win. So facing a little bit heavier of a workload, um, same same outcome. Just a couple goals. Again, one of them on a four-on-three and the other one on a very, very well-put-together power play goal. Again, that cro- those cross-size passes, the, the, there weren't really any goals that he let in that were his fault, I would say, this weekend. We talked about the two-way ability of Justin Barron on the last episode. Uh, what did you see from the pairing between him and Keaton Middleton? Because we did talk about the differences between that and what he did with Jacob McDonald and kind of the responsibilities of that. So what did you see from the two of them uh, this weekend? Well, I'm just going to put a disclaimer here. And I'm not a huge fan of Keaton Middleton. I mean, he's got the size, but he doesn't use it as, say, his teammate Andreas England does. When it comes to being a little more rough and tumble, um, his defense is serviceable, but his offensive choices are questionable at best sometimes. Uh, Baron, he wasn't overly noticeable on the ice during his shifts. He did play well to the game that we laid out last episode, you know, good, clean passing, uh, protecting the puck during two possessions or during possessions rather, not just two, (laughs) but he only had three shots in game one and he took two penalty minutes. That was his only stat in game two. So I would say Jacob McDonald can't come back from injuries soon enough. He's in a no contact Jersey up with the avalanche. He's starting to skate with them and everything. So 
Yeah. I, I really want to see Jacob McDonald paired with Justin Barron once again to just continue to help his growth and to really continue to have him thrive as a two-way defenseman for the Eagles. All right. So uh, one of the areas we talked about in the preview was the Canucks and their breakouts. Um, how did the Canucks do uh, in that area that we spoke about in the weekend preview? Uh, man, the, the breakaways seemed a little few and far between for the Canucks, um, from what I can recall anyway. Anytime they did break out in a rush, the Eagles' defense were pretty quick to adjust, especially Dennis Gilbert. Like, once Gilbert realized that the puck was going to be heading the other way, like, even before Abbotsford got possession of the puck, he was already positioning himself to go back on defense. Like, Gilbert is really good at that, and him and his pairing with Jordan Gross is... Yeah, I mean, really good offensive defenseman and a really good defensive defenseman. That's the first pairing you want on your team. But, you know, I just think that uh, even if the defense couldn't get to their man in time or couldn't get to the breakout in time, Ananen was focused and he made those tough saves. Even like Cronin said, even if they were kind of few and far between in that Saturday game, um, he still he still made him when he was faced with it and had to, you know, move laterally. Even when Abbotsford went cross ice, you know, his movement was quick enough to ward off the scoring chance and and deflect the puck away. I think Colorado needed to take advantage of no Jack Rathbone a little bit more um, on defense to score more in game one. I think they squandered it a little bit. Uh, they put up like 44 shots on goal, but I don't think they tested Spencer Martin. That was another former Eagle that we failed to account for, I think, in our preview. Spencer Martin got that game one start, 43 saves on 44 shots. And I actually talked to Martin after the game. He goes, yeah, I mean, I was with the Avalanche organization for three years. I played with the Eagles for that last season. I was coming into town, didn't hear from any of the coaching staff, didn't hear from anyone in the organization. Ooh. So Martin said, I decided to say hello on the ice. Ooh. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Wow. I mean, we knew Sheldon, like I always said, we knew Sheldon Drives was getting on the board in this game. That one, yeah. I'd have, I would have bet money on if I could find a way to. Um, oh, yeah. That would have been a bet for me. I don't think I remembered that Spencer Martin played for the Eagles. So, yeah, that would have been another one uh, where I'd have been like, oh, no, you know, I think he's probably going to have a, a, a big game here for this. But, uh, yeah, yeah, that's yeah. nobody like nobody sends you a note. Anything. Wow. I And, and it was the thing like – the media director for Abbotsford didn't travel in this game. So I asked Kevin McGlue, the Eagles media director, I said, can I go and interview Spencer Martin? He goes, well, the media director didn't travel. You know, I couldn't get a hold of him tonight. So you can maybe go down in the bowels of the stadium and wait for him. And, and so I'm like, well, that's going to be tough. So I, I started writing my article <laughs> and then I, like, I was like, all right, well, I'll see when they're down there. I go down there about 10 30 in the evening. They're about 10 minutes away from catching a bus. They're eating their post-game meals in the dining area right there as you go down the stairs from the press box. And I asked one of the guys, I said, hey, can I talk to Spencer Martin? He's like, yeah, we'll go grab him real quick. Just make it quick. We've got a, got a bus to catch. Yeah. And that was that was the first thing that he said when I asked him, how does it feel to be back in Colorado? He's like, oh, great trip down memory lane and everything. But nobody reached out, so I made sure I gave my salutations on the ice. I was like, oh, I, oh. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> Good quote too. Good for him. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Any closing thoughts uh, on, on the weekend for Abbotsford and Colorado before we see where they go from here and wrap up the show? Uh, physical series, really physical series. First period kind of feeling each other out as you do with new teams, but they weren't shy to put the body on as, as time increased. And uh, Dennis Gilbert even got a big hit on him um, in that second game he got just leveled and sent into the boards. And I think he might be out with a head injury for a couple weeks um, or a few weeks. So it was just a rough and tumble game. Um, had a fight. <laughs> Those are always fun. Dalton Smith uh, throwing, throwing some hand bones with, uh, oh, I forget the Abbotsford player, but it was a physical, it was a physical game, games, plural. And so, yeah, that was for the Eagles to not shy away from that. And, and, you know, get lured into penalties or anything. I think that was a good, that was a good kind of litmus test. I think for when, when one team greets you with physicality to, to meet them equally, I think the Eagles did that with Abbotsford this, this weekend. All right. 
But looking forward, Colorado remains, remains in fifth place in the Pacific Division, but not, you know, there there's not a lot of wiggle room around them. They are just 0. 0.011 percentage points between fourth place Henderson and 0. 0.013 percentage points behind third place Bakersfield. Uh, Colorado heads to the Midwest to take on the Milwaukee Admirals at Panther Arena over in Wisconsin on Saturday and Sunday. Uh, ever since losing back-to-back -back shootouts to Colorado in mid-January, the ads have been a mighty 12-2-1. Colorado has one more game against Manitoba on Wednesday, uh, February 23rd, before they host Colorado. Um, Abbotsford remains just below in Colorado in sixth place, 0 0.016 percentage points back of the Eagles in a tight middle of the pack Pacific, which is what we predicted in the midseason, <laughs> just not with the right team on the top. Right, right. Uh, they will host Stockton for the third and fourth time in team history on Friday, uh, the 26th and Sunday, the 28th, the ghost of Abbotsford past played the Canucks in California on November 5th and 6th for a three to two and two to one victories, uh, for the heat in, uh, in Abbotsford Stockton also defeated the Abbey Knox on February 3rd and 4th by scores of seven to three and two to one respectively. Uh, those feel like very different teams than what Abbotsford has now with a lot of the guys back in town. Um, oh, yeah. The Canucks uh, then go to face the Marlies in Toronto uh, in early March and Laval in Quebec uh, in the following days in March. So March 2nd uh, and March 9th, they're in Toronto. March 4th and 5th, uh, their first ever meetings against those two Canadian franchises. So quite a road ahead for Abbotsford. Uh both both teams playing against some some out of div, out of division games very unusual. Abbotsford is going to play an Eastern Conference team. Two Eastern Conference Two, teams yeah, like, in the North Division. That never happens for Pacific that never Division happens. teams. All right. Mm -hmm. Wow. Well, if you're Canadian, I suppose it's uh, I guess, a little bit more expected. I don't know. <laughs> I don't. I don't know why it would be like. Oh yeah, but they're like yeah, but you still have to go all that distance. Is I mean, I know customs is a pain, but is it that bad where it's like, nope, we won't like, I feel like you could have just kept going and gone to like, anyway, stories for another time. Yeah. Must get good discounts on Air Canada. Yeah. Well, that will do it for our weekend recaps. We are going to go to the cream of the crop before we head out and call it an episode. So we're going to take a break. And after the break, like I mentioned, we're going to go to the cream, the cream of the crop. The best players of the weekend. If you are just here for Colorado and Abbotsford, though, I, I do recommend that you stay. It is a good time, and we do you know, talk about the best players of the weekend from our perspective. If you are just here for the Eagles and then the Canucks, though, thank you very much for stopping by. Don't forget to subscribe wherever you're listening to us from so you can get episodes in a timely fashion. Also, check us out on the social meds. Links to our social media, as well as links to our YouTube channel and popular podcast links can be found on our Linktree page at l-i-n-k-t-r dot e-e slash the Calder Farbstead. Pers uh, subscriptions, not prescriptions. <laughs> subscriptions are good, you know, when you get your weekend preview and your weekend recap. So let you know when those episodes drop. Anyway, we're going to go pay some bills for the final time this episode, and we shall return very shortly. All right, Sean, I'm feeling a little madness, a little restrained madness. I'm a little tired tonight, but that doesn't mean that the macho levels can't be dialed up to 11. So without further ado, we're going to go to the cream of the crop, and we're going to talk about the best AHL players of the weekend that was from Sean O'Brien and the macho man C.C. Hockley. Dig it! All right, I will kick us off. Uh, my third cream of the crop this week is Troy Grosnick from the Providence Bruins. Stopped 64 of 65 shots on the weekend, a 985 save percentage, plus two dubs over the Hershey Bears. Doesn't get too much better than that if you're a goaltender. Uh, Troy Grosnick, my number three cream of the crop. Cece, who is your third cream of the crop? Well, you know, I'm going to have to go with Igor Sokolov. Not one, but two proper game-winning goals against Toronto this weekend. Yeah, they got a two-goal effort. He did anyway in game one on Friday. And they include that game-winning goal at 9.32 of the third period 
That's a four to three Belleville win. Yeah. Saturday game goes to overtime. Sokolov, like we talked about earlier, he gets that puck right on the doorstep. He ends it with a little over a minute left in the extra frame. The T10 tank. Yeah. Mowing down the Marlies in the weekend sweep. Igor Sokolov, my third cream of the crap for the weekend. Yeah. Number two for me is Matthew Phillips from the Stockton Heat. One goal, five assists, six points on the weekend, four primary points. Uh, anytime you put up six points in a weekend, you're going to end up on the cream of the crop somewhere. Matthew Phillips is my second cream of the crop this weekend. Great weekend from him. Cece, what do you got? Well, let me tell you, I love a good comeback story. It's like when I came back to WCW and I had gorgeous George and Tori Wilson on my side. And they asked me, what up, Mach? And I said, oh, yeah. So anyway, sorry, I love me a good comeback story. Ken Appleby from the Bridgeport Islanders. Yeah. <laughs> After six losses in a row to start off the season for Appleby, he then gets a 30-save shutout against the Hartford Wolfpack. That's his first shutout since April 17th, 2021 against the Hartford Wolfpack. Yeah! Oh, that's his sixth shutout in the sixth year of his AHL career. Gotta call Ricky Bobby because we're going to go to Applebee's. Ken Applebee's. Oh, yeah! <sighs> All right. And first for me, my first number one cream of the crop, Stefan Nason, Chicago Wolves. Uh, you score five goals on the weekend, including a game-tying goal on Saturday in the third period. Uh, outscored the Iowa Wild on the weekend by himself. Uh, yeah, that's that's good. Uh, Stefan Nason, number one cream of the crop for me. Cece, who do you got? My number one cream of the crop, it's a man by the name of A.J. Greer. Not A.J. Styles. don't get it twisted. It's A.J. Greer of the Utica Comets. Natty Hattie in the first period of the first game that the Comets played this weekend. Four total goals, all of them. All the goals for Utica and the Comets, 4-2 win over the Rochester Americans on Friday. Then he comes back on Saturday. The only shootout goal coming in the fourth round to give Utica the 3-2 win over the Lehigh Valley uh, Phantoms on Saturdays. I almost called them the Lehigh Valley Saturdays. I don't know what's going on in my brain, but A.J. Greer knows what's going on because he scored a lot, and he helped the Utica Comets be the man. And like my buddy Ric Flair used to say, to be the man, you got to beat the man. And the Utica Comets, they got the man. A.J. Greer delivering the top rope elbow drop. My number one cream of the crop on the weekend. Can you dig it? Yeah. All right. All right. Well, we do not have time for a quiz this week. No. And by we don't have time, I mean I ran out of time to make one. So that will uh, that will wrap us up. Cece, let's kick off the outro. The spirit of the Macho Man Randy Savage has left me, and that will do it for the show. Thank you all for watching and or listening. The Calder Farmstead is part of the Full Press Radio Network. You can listen to this and several other great hockey sports. And, of course, pro wrestling. Oh, Macho Man Spirit descended upon me there real quick. <laughs> but, yeah, you can listen to all those great programs at fullpresscoverage.com. You just click the podcast drop-down menu in the top right portion of the website. That's the list populating if you're not familiar with that sound effect. And you can enjoy. And with all of these wonderful options on Full Press Radio Network and elsewhere, we appreciate you tuning in to the Calder Farmstead. And if you guys are enjoying the Calder Farmstead, please make sure you subscribe so you get episodes in a timely fashion. Also, if you're listening on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or Amazon, please rate and review the podcast. Or if you're watching on YouTube, like the video, comment what you thought of the episode. Doing so helps others find the show and your reviews help us improve it. You can also follow the show on social media at Calder Farmstead on Twitter, at the Calder Farmstead on Instagram and Facebook. We have a pretty good time on there. It's probably worth uh, checking out. Links to all of that and more can be found on our Linktree page at L-I-N-K-T-R dot E-E slash the Calder Farmstead. Big thanks to Adrian Drake who made our theme music. You can find him on social media at A-D underscore dysfunction. That's A-D 
underscore D Y S F U N C T I O N. So we can make music for you too. CC, where can people find you? Well, my name is CC Hockley. You can find me representing full press hockey on Twitter at the dedicated AHL account for full press hockey at FPC underscore AHL FPC. And of course, standing for full press coverage, the main site that has the umbrella over all of us. You can find me at personal Twitter account, my personal Twitter account at CC Hawk S E E S E E H A W K mainly tweets about hockey, but Hey, you know, got to put my Wordle score somewhere. And uh, <laughs> Sean is a step above with the Gordle scores. So just going to, you know, admit that readily. But uh, but yeah, hopefully if it keeps me interested, it's not going to be bullshit for you. So I appreciate every follow I get. Uh, check out my writing on the Full Press Coverage Network. Put up a game recap against that Saturday matchup with Colorado and Abbotsford. And uh, quotes from Coach Cronin and forward Martin Kaut. Check that out at fullpresshockey.com. Sean, enough about me. Where can the people find you? I'm Sean O'Brien. You can find me on Twitter at Sean O'Brien81. That's S E A N O B R I E N 81. I'm also on Instagram at Sean O'Brien underscore 81. Uh, those are both personal accounts. My Twitter is more hockey and occasionally uh some pop culture takes my instagram is more the world around me which is mostly my dog parker who's adorable you can find my stats work on tableau at bit.ly slash data dump and chase that's all the graphs all the stats all that nerdy stuff uh that is again bit.ly slash data dump and chase all lowercase all one word cc i am incredibly tired take us home Gladly, gladly, gladly. That will do it for episode number 85 of the Calder Farmstead AHL podcast. For Sean O'Brien, I'm CeCe Hockley, and that'll do it for this evening. And as always, keep your stick on the ice. <laughs>